So in this video, I'm going to talk about the finite quantum well model. And in the last video about the infinite quantum well, we said that uh, it can often be inaccurate. So the problem is that this can be very inaccurate. So in practical quantum wells, where the actual well depth um, is on the order of a fraction of an electron volt, so like 0.1 electron volts, um, the energies that you would get, the energies that you would predict using the infinite quantum well model, so a ground state energy, E1, E2, and so on, uh, these would be rather inaccurate. And so we want a model that can predict the energies of uh, within our finite, uh, within this finite well, as well as give us the wave function, psi of x. So that's ultimately the goal, is we want to develop a model that gives us the energy, I, what are called the energy eigenvalues. So the, in other words, the energies of the states that we're solving for. So E1, E2, and so on. Uh, and we also want the wave function, psi1, psi2, and so on. And for the infinite case, we know that these are just, uh, so the energies could just be written as h bar squared, pi squared, n squared, where n is an integer, divided by two times the mass inside the well, uh, times the length of the well squared. Those were the energies for the nth energy level. And similarly, the, the wave functions you could write as either a cosine or a sine. So either as cosine kx or sine of kx, or let's say knx, uh, where kn was just equal to 2men over h bar squared. And so we want to do the same exact thing for a finite quantum well. So we want to figure out these uh, energy values as well as the wave functions. And so how do we do that? Um, well, it wasn't uh, told explicitly when we were solving for the infinite quantum well, but we use what are called boundary conditions. And if you've solved a lot of differential equations before, then you'll be very comfortable with these. But essentially we say that, well, uh, our quantum well, we can think about dividing it into three different parts. And let me make sure the heights are actually the same on each side. So we can think about dividing it into three different regions. Let's call them one, two, and three for now. And we know in the first region, we're gonna have some psi one of x. So it's gonna, the wave function is gonna take some form. Uh, in region two, it's gonna have some slightly different form. And similarly, in region three, it's gonna have a different form. And these are, not, um, uh, these are not to be confused with the energy levels. So why don't I just call these regions uh, A, B, and C instead of one, two, and three. So this will be region A, this will be region B, this will be region C. So psi C, psi B, psi A. And so the boundary conditions we're going to use are that psi uh, must be continuous. Uh, so the wave function itself, continuous, uh, the wave function itself can't have any discontinuities. So you can't have a wave function that goes like uh, well, no, it, it can't go like that. You can't have a wave function that goes like this, for example. So it can't uh, r rapidly or instantaneously change its value. And we're also going to say its derivative uh, must be continuous. Let's just say contin continuous. Um, and so the Similarly, the wave function's derivative can't look like this function. And where do these boundary conditions come from? Uh, well, you can actually derive these um, straight from Schrodinger's equation. If you make certain assumptions about what the potential V looks like, then you can just play around with the differential equation and show that these boundary conditions have to be satisfied. Now, this does make one assumption, and that's that the, uh, we're dealing with electrons right now, but that's that the electron mass has to be continuous. So the electron mass can't be different in region A than B than C. And in general, that's not true. Uh, and so you might have actually a different electron mass in this region than this region. And we'll relax that assumption in future videos. So I will show you how to solve this uh, without making that assumption. And so we expect our wave function to look like something smooth because it's not going to have any kinks. Uh, so since psi prime has to be continuous, it's not going to have any kinks like this 
um, it's also not going to have any discontinuities. So we're looking for a wave function that looks something like this. And so now we just have to solve the Schrodinger equation. So first let's set up a coordinate system. So let's say that our potential uh, we, we see is going to be on the x-axis or on the, sorry, on the y-axis. This is going to be our x-axis. And I'm going to define the center of the well to be x equals zero. So the well goes from uh, x equals L over two to x equals minus L over two. So the well has a total length L. And the reason I'm doing this is because this gives us a symmetric uh, potential. And this makes it much easier to solve Schrodinger's equation because basically this says that our solutions inside the well, uh, or actually our solutions in throughout all of X have to be either even or odd, uh, which means they either look like, for example, a cosine or a sine, but not a superposition of both. So it makes it much easier uh, to go about solving the equation. And so now we want to solve for the energy. So some there's going to be some ground state energy, for example, inside this well, some second state energy and so on. And we want to know what that is. So to do that, we need to write down Schrodinger's equation. Uh, and one form of that, if you rearrange things so that the second derivative with respect to x is on uh, one side, you'll get that d squared psi dx squared is equal to uh, the potential v of x minus the energy, uh, or two times the mass times the potential minus the energy divided by h bar squared times psi. And so the tricky thing is we're trying to solve for two things at once. We're trying to solve for the energy and we're trying to solve for the wave function. They're both unknown. But we do know something about the energy. We know it's somewhere in this region because we're only interested in uh, quantum mechanical states that, have, uh, that are what's called bound. So uh, any states that have energy lower than this quantum well edge are going to be what's called bound states. And these are the states that are going to affect things like our absorption. Uh, they're going to be what's responsible for quantum confinement. So these are the states that we're most interested in. So we expect the energy to be somewhere in here. And if we know that, then in this region, uh, so in the quantum well region in the middle, uh, the energy is larger than the potential, which means that this coefficient is going to be negative. Uh, and so if we just write the Schrodinger's equation as a more generic looking thing, so d squared psi dx squared is equal to some negative coefficient, let's call that k squared times psi, um, we know the solutions to this. This is, this is our sine and our cosine solutions. Uh, and here, since the potential, uh, so let's call this, let's call this uh, v is equal to zero. And let's say this is v is equal to v naught. So at the bottom of the well, the potential is zero. At the top of the well, it's equal to v naught. And so in that case, uh, k within the well is just going to be 2me over h bar squared. And so we know what the solutions are inside the well. Now what about outside the well? And forgive me, this is starting to get a little messy. Um, so let's, uh, let's erase some of this stuff. Um, well, outside the well, the energy we said was, uh, the energy is still less than the edge of the well, so it's less than the potential V naught. Uh, and so the, in this region, the energy is less than V naught. And so this coefficient out front is actually positive. And so if this coefficient is positive, uh, then let's rewrite the Schrodinger equation again. d squared psi dx squared is just equal to some positive coefficient alpha squared times psi. And this just gives us exponential solutions. So e to the minus alpha x and e to the plus alpha x. And here alpha is equal to 2m e minus v, or actually, sorry, v minus e. Because um, that's a, v minus e is a positive quantity uh, over h bar squared. And so without really doing any math, uh, let me just redraw our, our quantum well here. We know that inside the well, our solutions are gonna be sines and cosines. 
and we know what the we know what the k vector value or what the k value is um, because it just in terms of the energy let me rewrite it down here 2m times the energy over h bar squared and we know in these outer regions uh, the solutions are going to look like this e to the minus alpha x uh, or e to the plus alpha x and e to the minus alpha x and alpha is just 2m times v minus e over h bar squared and so all we have to do now is figure out is apply our boundary conditions and figure out what the coefficients out front so let's call this a b c d for example e f we need to figure out what the coefficients are out front of each of these solutions and what exactly our entire psi of x looks like and this will give us the energy within the well or really i should say the energy of the overall state because it's sort of continuous throughout the entire system not just in the well strictly speaking and so in the next video we're going to actually solve for all of these coefficients as well as for the energy and to do that we need to apply our boundary conditions and we're also going to apply uh, normalizability so in other words the wave function has to be normalizable it can't be um, it can't blow up uh, as we approach infinity so it can't grow and grow and grow infinitely so if you like the video uh, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more electrical engineering type videos uh, if you have any questions or comments please post them down below and i'll see you next time thanks